Let's bring this project to an end. After I desoldered all the wires from my prototype handhelds, I once again gathered the necessary components and added three tactile push buttons to the pile. For the case, I went with a classical Game Boy housing that I found online for a pretty decent price. Mine came with the mandatory buttons and rubber conductive pads, but we're going to need two more additional buttons and obviously the fitting rubber pads. Now let's start the mounting process with the LCD. Since it does not fit without modifications, I had to slowly and carefully remove the upper 4 screw brackets, but make sure to keep them for later. After flattening out the rest of the surface, the LCD did fit, but the cutout on the front was still too small. So I measured the width and height of the visible screen of the LCD and compared them to the dimensions of the case indentation only to realize that a gap of 1mm from each side was necessary to house the screen properly. I marked the required cuts with a scalpel and used a rotary tool with a cutting wheel to enlarge the cutouts. Afterwards the screen still didn't fit perfectly, so I used a small file to complete this task. But before gluing the LCD in place, I removed another screw bracket above the B button, used white tape to cover the A and B button, revealed their location and size with a pencil and connected their center points with a line. Orthogonal to this line are marked two points with a distance of 15mm from the center points and used an 11mm drill to create two holes with the newly created markings as a center point. And now that we've got an X and Y button hole, it was time to get the LCD in position and glue it in place with plenty of hot glue on all of its sides. Next, I placed the speaker in its indentation and also secured it with hot glue, as well as the 3D printed button wells around the X and Y button hole. You can get those button wells from the pseudomod markets or print them yourself with the STL file. I continued by dropping the four buttons in their place and adding the rubber pads on top, which were a bit too big, at least one of them. So I removed small parts of unnecessary rubber and positioned them again, this time successfully. Afterwards I hot glued the previously removed screw brackets next to the buttons and got myself a piece of perf board with copper strips. I placed it on top of the buttons and marked an outline that would include all the screw brackets but would not interfere with other components. Through the help of a cutter and brute force I created the required shape, snipped off the axis of the guiding rods for the rubber pads and placed the perf boards once again on top. With the help of a 2mm drill I created holes through the perf board above the screw brackets and used the included screws of the case with a M3 washer to secure the board. But needless to say my first attempt was terrible. That is why I created a new piece of perf board and repeated the same procedure, with much better results. Afterwards I drilled the other two holes and secured the perf board firmly by using the second and third screw brackets. And just like that, the A, B, X and Y button felt pretty authentic while pressing. So I repeated this procedure by dropping the D-pads as well as the rubber pads in place, shortening the guiding rods and using the same cutting, breaking, drilling and screwing technique to mount the second button perf bore to the case. Now all the buttons felt like they should work, but there were no wires connected yet. For that, I marked the spots on the perf board where the black conductive material of the rubber pads were visible, removed the boards from the case, created a common ground by connecting one side of all buttons together through the help of silvered copper wire and added one wire of a ribbon cable to the other side of each button. After remounting the boards to the case, I hooked up the common ground in each button individually to my multimeter in order to measure its resistance. If the multimeter presents a value when pressing a button, we know that everything should work fine later on. And after this first test, one half of the handheld was complete. Time for the second one. There I wanted to mount the over discharge protection circuit and the Raspberry Pi inside the cartridge slot, but a big part of it is conductive metal. So I removed this part and created a custom extended 3D model of it that was then 3D printed. 
but I still needed to remove two more guiding rods in order to make the 3D print fit inside the case. Afterwards, I used the metal part as a template to drill the four mounting holes in the 3D print, attached it to the case with the four screws and positioned the Raspberry Pi inside the cartridge slot. I drilled the mounting holes for the Pi through the case and removed the 3D print afterwards to drill the remaining two holes. And by the way, I extended the diameter of the mounting holes with a 3mm drill, because M3 bolts are just more common than M2.5 bolts. Next it was time to attach the three tactile switches, which will be used for the TL, TR and hotkey button. I simply marked a spot 10mm right and left from the battery compartment and another one 5mm above it. With a 3.5mm drill, I then created the three holes, pushed the shaft of the switches through them and secured it all with hot glue. After the procedure, the button still worked fine. So I snipped off the leads on one side, created once again a common ground and soldered the wire to the other lead of each switch. Then I enlarged the holder of the 3.5mm jack with a file and used a small drop of hot glue to secure it in place. Now if you watched the previous part of this project carefully, you might have noticed that there was something missing inside the battery compartment. But thankfully you can easily salvage those two metal contacts from pretty much every available AA battery holder. Simply push the parts in place and secure it all with hot glue. Afterwards I placed the main power switch of the system inside its cavity, used a 2mm drill to create the mounting holes and used small wood screws to secure the switch in place. For the last part of this never ending mounting process, I reattached my 3D print, hot glued the audio switch to the upper right recess, the volume control wheel underneath it, followed by the audio amp on the left side of the 3D print and finally the RC filter circuit inside an indentation in the down right corner, right after I soldered the necessary wires to the circuit. And just like that both halves of the handheld were complete. The only thing left to do was the wiring, which was pretty much the same as I described it in part 1 of this project. The only thing that is different this time was the increased number of buttons that all need to connect to the GPIOs of the Raspberry Pi. But as long as you carefully follow the given connection diagram, it should work out just fine. Once everything was wired up, I secured the Raspberry Pi, pushed the protection circuit inside the cartridge slots, flattened out the surface of the battery compartment and reattached two of the screw brackets to the LCD with hot glue in order to close everything up with the given screws. After plugging in the batteries and flipping on the power switch, this project was finally complete and is definitely super fun to play. I hope you liked this video. If so, don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Consider supporting me through Patreon to keep such videos coming. Stay creative and I will see you next time.